Now, this Clement here. So, most Christians um, are familiar with the books of the Bible, and we look at those books as inspired in that they were either preserved by Jah and kept for us to read today, or in some cases, there are records that Jah speaks or he speaks through prophets and the result is inspiration. And so that their speech we take as directly from God versus just his preserving of records and information, uh, which we also see or we believe takes place. So, but by that, we do not mean that the Bible, the, the, the common 66 books typically included in the, in, the, in the Bible, although Catholic Bibles will include more, that doesn't mean that we believe that only those books or only the people that wrote those books did the will of Jah or taught truth. It's not the case. In fact, we have persons in the Bible quoting other texts, um, like the Assumption of Moses or the Book of Enoch. And it doesn't mean that every single thing in those books is accurate either. Just like with any other text or person, the only way we're going to know if something is accurate is by verifying it, by checking it out to make sure uh, that it is um, consistent with the facts that we can otherwise discern. So now with Clement, he's referred to in the scriptures, and we actually have, we have two letters that are attributed to Clement. And really only the first one is considered to be genuine, that is actually written by the Clement that you see referred to here by Paul. Um, there are members in the early church like Eusebius and Origen that accept the first letter of Clement as, as legitimate. Uh, it's actually attached. The letter of First Clement is included in the Alexandrian manuscript. So it has all it has most of the books of the Bible, and then at the end it has the letter of First Clement. Now I've read the entire first letter of Clement. I've translated some of it, and I don't really find a lot to, that I would take issue with, or really anything that I think you would you would need to take issue with. Um, that's, for example, some kind of significant error. Um, in fact, what I do find is a number of things in his writings that can be useful. He quotes the biblical text frequently. You know, often you'll find in these early writers numerous texts from the Bible quoted within it, so you can get a sense of the text that they had at the time and how consistent it was with either the Greek version or the Hebrew Aramaic texts. So let me just share a couple things with you from First Clement and a few additional facts regarding his letter so that you can then decide for yourself whether it's something you want to spend time reading. I think you'll find it uplifting. I think you'll find it encouraging if you get a translation that's a little bit more modern. I'm using Hul's translation. It's a little older, but I find it a little clearer. So let me read the very first verse of First Clement where he, write, he writes, on account of the sudden and repeated calamities and mischances, brethren, that have come upon us, we suppose that we have the more slowly given heed to the things that are disputed among you, and to the foul and unholy sedition, alien and foreign to the elect of God, which a few headstrong and self-willed persons have kindled to such a degree of madness, that your venerable and famous name, worthy to be loved of all men, is greatly blasphemed. And so, the reason I quote that verse to start with is because it helps us to get a sense of the date of the letter. So there's two potential periods in the first century where this likely fits. He talks about repeated calamities and difficulties um, growing uh, at the time. And so it's often dated to either around or after the reign of Nero, around 66 to 68. CE or uh, around 97 during the time of Domitian. Both of these periods involved uh, significant persecution to the early Christians. And Clement, so Clement, it appears Clement probably died just before the end of the first century and his letter is is attributed to either 70 AD around after the time of uh, Nero or um, after the time of Domitian, 
and um, some even date a little bit more into the second century, but obviously Clement would have been dead by then. So I, I tend to favor a date between 68 and 99 or 100 CE, just to round it off. And so this is an early letter. This is an early letter by a person named in the Bible and whom I believe we can look to for information regarding the activities of Christians in the first century at that time. And also, uh, since he was close with Paul and others, there is a lot of interpersonal information we can glean about the things that they were going through in the same way that Paul talks to us about persons like Euodia and Syntyche and Clement. Let me share a couple other verses from 1 Clement before we wrap up today's text. Now, in chapter 4, Clement, um, he does something interesting. You know how in the book of Hebrews, the author speaks about faith, and he goes on to to list... Oh, I can see Pa D in the background. I'll introduce him another time. You can see how the author of Hebrews dis- discusses various examples of people of faith, and, and he regularly says, by faith, by faith, and then he gives the examples. So you see something interest, something similar in First Clement chapter 4, where instead of faith, he uses envy. And he talks about how envy caused so much destruction in the world. I, I recommend you look at that. I found it very enlightening, and it, it, it's not that it presents any new information about the people that Clement references, but I mean, he discusses, he goes back all the way to Eve, and, and and discusses how she was envious, basically, right? When when the serpent tempted her to become like God, well, the feeling was envy, the desire to become, seeing, become something that is really what someone else is, not you. And so you become envious of whatever that other person is rather than appreciate yourself. And he does this. He goes on and he discusses a numerous, numerous people. He uses examples of faith as well. He cites figures like Noah, Abraham, Lot, Moses, women like Rahab. And then in uh, chapter 16 of 1 Clement, chapter 2, um, chapter 16, verse 2, he refers to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the scepter of the majesty of God. And then he quotes and applies Isaiah 53 uh, to Jesus, which we do as well. Very powerful text uh, or chapter uh, in the Bible, Isaiah 53, that really could only identify with Jesus from history in our view. Then in chapter 20 of 1 Clement, he discusses the various systems of order that God put in place and which he maintains from the stars to various uh, activities in the heavens and the earth. And then in chapter 31 and verse 1, he says this. He says, Let us cleave, therefore, to this blessing, and let us see what are the ways of blessing." Let us consult the records of the things that happened from the beginning. So they have been, our Christian brothers and sisters, uh, whether it's Clement, Paul, or anyone else, regularly consulted the records that were kept to that time. Records that we have even today. So if we have copies, for example, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, or a, pretty much an entire copy of First Clement. Well, think of all the different texts that existed at that time and that they had available to them before periods of destruction um, made them less available. So this is something regularly encouraged. We, we all should look at the records that we have from the beginning to find out what's been happening. And that's why, as part of the Great Message Show, I've been dealing with Jah in the book of Genesis, because those are accurate records that we can use to show real history related to Jah. Now, let me just move through a few other items from 1 Clement chapter 37, verse 2. He says, let us consider those who fight under our rulers. He's talking about Roman uh, centurions. How orderly and obediently and submissively they perform what is commanded them. All are not prefects, or commanders of thousands, or commanders of hundreds, or commanders of fifties, or such like, but each in his own rank perform what has been ordered by the king or the commanders. The great cannot exist without the small, nor the small without the great. There is a certain mixture in all things, he says, and from there arise their use. 
And then in verse 5 of 37, Clement says, Let us take, for example, our body. The head is nothing without the feet, nor the feet without the head. The smallest members of the body are necessary and useful to the whole body. And all unite and work with harmonious obedience for the preservation of the whole body. Very similar to how Paul talks about us as a body, joint members working together uh, for the glory of the Christ. So never feel that your role or position is too insignificant. That would be like saying that one of your smaller or least used parts of your body is no good. Now who believes that? Who would be prepared to get rid of any part of your body just because it's small or uh, less significant than some others? No one. We value every piece of our body, or we should, because it's a gift from Jah. In the same way, everyone who serves Christ is a gift from Jah. There is no insignificance. There are simply different roles for different people that we all can fulfill if we work together. And then he uses Jesus as the example. He says, The apostles received from us the gospel from our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ received it from God. Christ, therefore, was sent out from God. This is 1 Clement 42, 2, 1 and 2. And the apostles were sent from Christ. And both these things were done in good order, according to the will of God. So, again, you have this harmonious structure or body working together. Uh, from Jesus on down, Jesus followed the will of his Father, the apostles followed the will of Jesus, and thereafter we have received from them and continued uh, to serve them. And then I'm going to wind this up here in a second, but I'm going to share a couple more verses. Verse 40, uh, Chapter 46, verse 7, he says, Why do we tear apart and rend asunder the members of Christ and make sedition against our body and come to such a degree of madness that we, we forget we are members of one another? We forget that. Um, before I started the Christian Witnesses of Jah and I was involved with the Watchtower, it was just nonstop arguing and debating, trying to justify things from the past. Very little attention focused where it should be on proclaiming the great message. And Clement also quotes, he quotes the figure of wisdom. He quotes wisdom in chapter 57, verse 3, and says, For thus saith the most excellent wisdom, Behold, I will send upon you the language of my spirit. I will teach you my word. And he goes on to quote wisdom uh, several more times. And then he says, Let us therefore submit to his all holy and glorious name. He's talking about wisdom. And escape the threats that have been before spoken by wisdom against the disobedient that we may abide trusting in the most holy name of his greatness. He's talking about Jesus. He's identifying Jesus as the wisdom spoken of in the Bible and elsewhere as having existed with Jah from the beginning. That's why Jesus is with God in the beginning in John 1.1. 1, 1. See, almost the same language used in Proverbs chapter 8 of wisdom being in the beginning with Jah. All right, I'm going to wind this up here. Just a few more highlights. Actually, one more. Uh, chapter 59, verse 2, Clement writes, Making our earnest prayer and supplication that the Maker of all things may keep uninjured in all the world the number of those who have been numbered as His elect through His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, through whom He hath called us from darkness unto light and from ignorance to a knowledge of His glorious name. That's referring to the Father there. So even, even, of course, in Clement, the name of the Father and of God and, of, and the teachings of wisdom were important, just like they were for Paul and the other early Christians. So I wanted to share some of these selections from Clement with you, First Clement, and I wanted to also highlight the importance of women in the early uh, Christian congregation and, the, and, and thereafter, uh, according to persons like Clement. And by early Christian congregation, I mean the examples we cited from the book of Acts, uh, which would not be too far removed from the things uh, that Clement had to deal with or that he uh, witnessed and wrote about. So really, the entire first century period involving the early Christians was one where they were willing to work with everyone and to commit to people who were willing to submit to Jah and Jesus in order to proclaim the great message. 
So in this regard, keep in mind that we are all one body. And while some of us may have, quote unquote, more prominent roles, that does not mean that it is in any way more important than anyone else's role. Because without the feet, the body can't move. Without the hands, the body can't reach out and touch. So it's not a question of the significance of the member. It's a question of whether we can work together to function as we were intended to function. And in the Christian sense, we, were, we are supposed to be loving, encouraging, and help one another while we praise John, follow Jesus Christ.